right, welcome everyone. My name is Jessica from PhysioQ. We're gonna get started today. Uh, I wanna welcome all of you to today's workshop on heart rate variability. Now, I'm just gonna start off by quickly explaining how the session's gonna run. This talk should last just over an hour and it'll be followed by a Q&A session, but there will also be two additional Q&A sessions distributed throughout the talk to keep it a little bit interactive. So Dr. Ahn is going to host about five minute Q&A, a third into the session, two thirds into the session, another five minutes, and then at the end, there should be another five or 10 minutes uh, for more questions. So feel free to send your questions in the chat during those sessions and um, he'll answer them at that time. Now, before I pass it over to the speaker of today's session, I would just like to quickly introduce PhysioQ, the nonprofit organization hosting today's event. So we are PhysioQ, a Boston-based organization made up of a team of health researchers and data scientists. And our goal is to democratize access to health research. Now, one way we do that is through engagement and education, either by providing free educational content on our academy page that you can find on our website, or through running sessions like these, for example, um, on topics related to physiological research. The second way we democratize access is by creating tools like LabFront that help support the research community and more specifically, researchers interested in collecting physiological data in their studies. So as you know, today's session's topic is on heart rate variability. And after last session, we did have some attendees reach out to us to ask us for suggestions of simple and affordable ways to collect HRV data. So please allow me to briefly explain how one of our tools called LabFront can help you do just that. So LabFront is a platform that allows researchers to collect and analyze their participants' smartwatch data in a sort of integrated, centralized way. So our partnership with Garmin allows us to directly access their smartwatch sensors and sort of turn up that frequency and collect higher resolution data than would typically be available with other consumer wearables. And this data is beat to beat interval data or BBI as some of you know it. Now, why is this important? From BBI data, researchers are then able to derive and calculate heart rate variability. And so if any of you are considering collecting HRV in a future study, please uh, don't hesitate to reach out to us and ask us any questions. We would also welcome you to sign up to our free platform. We have a free version available um, if you currently own a Garmin and would like to try it out for yourself. All right, so now I'll be passing it over to one of our most avid supporters, Dr. Andrew Ahn. Dr. Ahn is an internal medicine physician with a background in physics, engineering, and physiological signal analyses. He is also an assistant professor in medicine and radiology at Harvard Medical School. And a fun fact about Andrew is that he was the lead medical advisor for Team Dynamical Biomarkers, who were the runners-up winner for the famous $10 million Qualcomm X Prize tricorder competition. We are extremely grateful to have him here with us today. Thank you so much, Dr. An, for joining us. Um, he's here to share his very in-depth knowledge on heart rate variability. So I'll be passing it over to him without further ado. Dr. Ahn, you have the virtual floor. Great. Thank you, Jess, for that introduction. Let me see if I could uh, start the slides here. Perfect. Can you guys actually see the... We sure can. Okay, cool. That's great. All right. All right. Well, thank you for, uh, thank you, Jess, for that introduction. Thank you all for joining us um, in, this morning or evening or wherever you are. Um, so the title of this talk is Meta Perspective on Heart Rate Variability, Antiquated or Indispensable. Uh, this is part two. Um, and let me see. Yes. So this is my disclosure side. I have no conflicts of interest with this present material. I'm having problems. Okay, there we go. So um, as mentioned in my first talk, this is the way I interpret how heart rate variability has evolved through the past 50 years, and it's divided to five stages. Understanding heart rate variability, heart rate variability as a marker of autonomic nervous system, heart rate variability as a marker of body-wide function, heart rate variability within the construct of mind-body interaction, and heart rate variability itself as a desirable category or as a desirable target. Now, why these categories have been divided accordingly will become clear when this talk series is over. But I really must apologize in advance that this series just goes a lot in depth. And what I thought was going to be a two to three part series is turning out to be a five-parter. 
So um, I, I apologize for that, but you know, I think the intent is, and um, my intent as well as PhysioQ's intent is to really import, empower you to be able to do research well. And to, in order to do it well is to really get a, a deep um, understanding of heart rate variability to the point where you become the resident expert. So um, with that in mind, I think this talk also will probably run over uh, an hour. So um, for those people who have to leave, no worries. This should be recorded and posted on YouTube. In fact, the first one is was as well. Okay. So just a quick review. Um, last talk uh, for part one, we talked about understanding heart rate variability. And this largely focused in the 1970s and 80s where physiology was the emphasis or the focus. Um, I stated that 1970s, 80s was the golden age of physiology. And that is the time when they started to really um, understand or develop certain methods for measuring heart rate variability. And just as a reminder, this graph shows heart rate uh, or more specifically RR interval over time. And RR our intervals or sort of heart rate is much more about the tone or the C level while the heart rate variability is the fluctuations that operate around uh, this sea level or the tone. And if I, if you remember, I, I give a little bit uh, much more, I gave more details about the physiology underlying this, um, but a lot of it happens at the sinoatrial node, the SA node. And at the SA node, we talked about how the vagal nerve or the parasympathetic nervous system operates uh, much quicker. It has a rapid onset with quick execution and short recovery time. You can see that the vagal nerve being stimulated here, that the heart rate quickly drops down. And then the moment you stop, it quickly recovers to its baseline rate. And then for the sympathetic system, it is uh, has a delayed onset with slow execution and a long recovery time. So when you st stimulate the sympathetic nerve directly, it has a lag, there's a slow rise in the heart rate. And then as you turn off the, the stimulation, you have a slow recovery. And these dynamics explain a little bit of why heart rate variability shows a little different things at different frequencies. I talked about um, the various measures of heart rate variability. There's frequency and time domain. The frequency domain has these measures, high frequency, low frequency, very low frequency, ultra low frequency, and then the ratio between low frequency and high frequency. And uh, the high frequency uh, is, correlates with the respiratory sinus rhythmia, which is largely the parasympathetic nervous system because it operates fast. The parasympathetic nervous system operates at a fast uh, dynamics. The low frequency has a combination of parasympathetic and sympathetic, and it is uh, accounted for by the bare reflex and some vascular uh, mechanisms. Very low frequency uh, probably correlates with temperature regulation, hormones, some uh, intrinsic nervous system. And then the ultra low frequency deals with thermal regulation, hormonal changes in the circadian rhythm. And then we talked about the time domain, uh, the standard deviation of NN intervals, the RMS of uh, successive NN intervals, and then P uh, NN 50 are the ones that I talked about. Again, I'm going through this quickly because this is all a review of part one. Um, and just as a reminder, I want you to remember that when we're talking about NN in interval over time, uh, when we a lot of these measures include the successive differences of NN intervals, and what that does is it sort of illuminate, eliminates the, the long-term variability, and we're just focusing on the short-term variability. So the measures that incorporate that um, incorporate this successive difference, RMM, SSD, and PNN50. Uh, deal with the high frequency heart rate variability. So it deals with the parasympathetic nervous system, okay? So the summary of part one um, is the 1970s, 80s saw major advances in heart rate variability physiology measures. At rest, the parasympathetic nervous tone is normally greater than the sympathetic uh, tone. And then the heart rate variability frequency domain, each frequency range is associated with a specific physiologic process. And then high frequency heart rate variability correlates with the vagal parasympathetic nervous system. And with this. And, uh, and then basically the faster S uh, sympathetic activity filtered out at the SA node. 
In the time domain, the armrest SD PNN50 correlates with high frequency heart rate variability. And then the standard deviation and an interval depends on the duration of time series analyzed. Now, this was a quick rush of part one. I'm sorry, it went very quickly, but I just wanted to, you know, we went a lot of detail in the, in the YouTube video, so you could take a look at that. Okay. So that was part one. Now we're focusing on part two. And part two is heart rate variability as a marker of autonomic nervous system. And what I'm talking about is at this time is the 1980s and 1990s when cardiovascular medicine was pretty much at its golden age. And where we where research is what I say is focused on reductionistic approaches, basically breaking down a lot of the components, focusing on specific factors that are involved in disease processes. And so as a result of this approach, the heart rate variability became a way to sort of focus in and hone in on the autonomic nervous system. In the 1980s and 90s, and so I, in my perspective, this was sort of the golden age of cardiology. Um, the reason I say this, I mean, this is from my personal experience. This is when I was in medical school and residency during this time. Um, there was a buzz in cardiology. There was a lot of interest. Basically, a lot of the top residents wanted to go into cardiology fellowship. And um, I remember our chair um, in cardiology, I went to University of Michigan for residency. His name was Bertram Pitt, who was uh, head of large, a lot of these large um, RCTs, sort of walked around with a lot of sort of composure and respect. And I think a lot of people were afraid of him. So, it, you know, cardiology to me uh, in the 1980s and 90s was the golden age. And the reason for this was that there was a convergence of a lot of things that developed during that time. So in the coronary, that was when coronary catheterization pretty much reached its, its forefront. In the 1980s was when you had the first treatment for RMIs. And then in the 1990s, you saw rapid growth of that. You also saw, so the incorporation of devices such as pacemakers, defibrillators, and then you had availability of medical treatments. In the 1986 was the, the which was the first statin drug available, which was approved by the FDA. And in addition, you had a lot of the infrastructure things that you were needed in order to deliver good cardiovascular care. That included cardiac care units. The first one established in Edinburgh in 1964. And then you had a rapid adoption of CCUs all across the country in the 1970s and 80s. And you have <clears throat> emergency medical services, uh, which started to begin in the 1969 and then really sort of expanded in the 1970s. This is a picture. Um, I don't know if this may sort of reveal my age, but this is a TV show in the 1970s called Emergency 51. And uh, this was sort of the, the first time where EMS sort of played into um, everyone's you know, home TV and people got to recognize the importance of EMS. And then in 1970s and later in the 1980s, you started to have ACL guide, uh, ACLS guide, guidelines, basically how to deal with uh, you know, uh, significant cardiovascular compromise or failure, such as ventricular arrhythmias or fibrillation. And the reason also that cardiology received a lot of uh, attention was because cardiovascular death was the leading cause of death throughout through much of the 20th century. This was true the 1980s and 1990s. Um, this also included you know, stroke, which was uh, number three as a leading cause. So cardiovascular sometimes incorporates stroke as well. Um, this little blip happens to be the 1918 uh, influenza. Um, but otherwise, you could clearly see that heart disease, cardiovascular disease, was an important cause of death in the United States and all across the world. Um, and this is a slide that I used in part one. And this breaks down sort of the, the, the heart rate variability publications done by each discipline. And you could see that in the 1980s and 1990s and the 2000s and the 2010s, uh, cardiovascular research played prominently in heart rate variability research. Uh, this sort of, it was number two uh, behind OBGYN because OBGYN at that time was very interested in fetal heart rate monitoring. 
But then uh, due to the rise of cardiovascular research, you saw that really gained prominence uh, in the 1990s and 2000s. And many of the heart rate variability studies were embedded in a lot of these large randomized controlled clinical trials. You know, the cardiology uh, field has these very cute acronyms for large trials, such as HOPE and SOLVE and Dynamite. Um, a lot of it did, did incorporate um, heart rate variability uh, in their studies. And so heart rate variability was uh, played prominently uh, in a lot of the cardiovascular research. So the goals of this talk for part two is, is to appreciate how science of heart rate variability has evolved over the past 50 years, to understand how different perspectives of heart rate variability have emerged, to review the clinical uses for heart rate variability, and to recognize the various ways to assess autonomic nervous system, and to appreciate the factors that influence heart rate variability. So as mentioned in the last talk, the last major position or consensus paper on heart rate variability put out by a major medical professional society was in 1996. And there were only two clinical indications for heart rate variability mentioned in that position statement. And they were post-myocardial infarction and diabetic neuropathy. So that makes my job easy because there's only two uh, conditions that really for where you know, heart rate variability was indicated. And so I'll go into that in a little more detail. And uh, the, the thing that um, many were focusing on during this time was sudden cardiac death. Now, any clinician who takes care of patients will, uh, will appreciate the significance of sudden cardiac death, which is often attributed to abnormal rhythms such as this, is the ventricular fibrillation. Um, I remember my first case when I was a medical student, um, there was a portly gentleman who came in to the coronary heart care unit and we were rounding on this patient and this patient was very angry about not you know, being in the hospital and having to stay in this unit. And while uh, he was talking, all of a sudden his eyes rolled back, he fell back onto the back onto the bed and basically was in VFED arrest after he got his heart attack. Um, and after that, I have never minimized the importance of ventricular fibrillation. Um, and this is accounts, you know, ventricular fibrillation or sudden cardiac death accounts for half the deaths of coronary heart disease in the United States. and often occurs outside of the hospital or in the emergency department within the one hour of symptom onset. So you can see this is the normal sinus rhythm and then this really fast rhythm, which in, in, inhibits, uh, impairs the ability of blood flow to the brain. Now, uh, this sudden cardiac death after myocardial, often occurs after a heart attack or a myocardial infarction. And you can see that it often occurs right after uh, or in, immediately in the sort of the few days after a, a heart attack or myocardial infarction. And you can see that it's the prevalence is much higher in the, the first month and then slowly goes down over a period of months to years. This graph actually divides into categories of ejection fraction. So after you have a heart attack and if it's a significant heart attack, you can impair your the, the pumping function of your heart and it could go down as low as you know less than 30%. What's normal is around above 55%. So uh, clearly, if you had a larger heart attack, then you have higher chance of developing sudden cardiac death. And it is believed that, you know, some have argued that you can divide these categories into three parts. The acute phase, which is about 40 days after the heart attack or myocardial infarction, subacute, which is about 40 days to six months, and the remote, which is uh, longer than uh, more than six months. So how does the autonomic nervous system play into studying cardiac death and why is this important? And they had um, studies done in the 1970s done by Dr. Lau, who's a renowned uh, cardiologist from Brigham, uh, is that uh, they took uh, dogs, unfortunately dogs, and they, uh, measure their EKG and subsequently introduce three pulses, what they call the RT pulsing. 
And um, on occasion, uh, the RT pulsing will lead to nothing, that the EKG will return, the heartbeats would return as normal. And in, in some cases, this would lead to ventricular fibrillation. And what he was able to do was he would actually be able to stimulate the sympathetic nervous system by finding the sympathetic nerve and, uh, or specifically the stalate ganglion, uh, which is part of the sympathetic nervous system, stimulate that. And you can see that this is a normal rhythm and then it induces ventricular fibrillation. Uh, and uh, pressure control just means that the pressure was controlled because sometimes when your heart, your blood pressure is increased, it sort of reduces the uh, sympathetic nervous system. But you can see that when the sympathetic nervous system was activated, there was a higher risk of ventricular fibrillation. And on the flip side, the parasympathetic nervous system has a protective effect. Uh, and this graph show that, again, from Dr. Loud in 1977. When you do an RT pulsing, and then after about 50 milliseconds, your, your ventricular fibrillation threshold uh, significantly decreases. And then um, after, uh, after a while, it sort of returns to normal. However, when you do a stale stimulation where you activate the sympathetic nervous system, it reduces the ventricular fibrillation th threshold even further. And then the duration is longer. So the chances of developing ventricular fibrillation persist longer than uh, without the sympathetic nervous system and then re slowly returns back to its baseline. And then if you stimulate the vagus nerve, it reverses essentially this effect and that you basically return the baseline. So the sympathetic nervous system enhances possibility of ventricular fibrillation or sudden death, the parasympathetic reverses that. And, um, you know, these, these, these are studies that were done in dogs. Again, uh, when you had uh, at baseline, this was sort of the control. You had closed uh, evaluation of the heart rhythms. When they did an open thoracotomy, basically surgery to access the heart, you had the ventricular fibrillation threshold decrease, and then the vagal stimulation subsequently returned. It, in fact, it sort of even further reduced the chances of getting an abnormal rhythm or VFib. The stalate, uh, stalate stimulation directly caused, again, reduction of the VFib threshold. Uh, vagal stimulation recovered or uh, addressed that. Same with norepinephrine infusion. But interestingly, administrating beta blockers, which inhibit or um, sort of inhibit, antagonize the effects of the sympathetic nervous system, it uh, essentially eliminates uh, any of these interventions and it sustains this ability to protect against ventricular fibrillation and the vagal stimulation does nothing to change that. So the vagal stimulation reverses what is uh, at higher risk of the sympathetic nervous system but it basically doesn't enhance it above what, you know, basically sort of reverses the sympathetic nervous system's effect on ventricular fibrillation. Uh, this is another study. Uh, this was also done by Lown at that time. I, I wanted to add this on just because I found it interesting was that stress really uh, was an important factor for reducing the threshold for VFib. This was an unfortunate experiment where dogs received a Pavlovian conditioning, basically electric shock daily at each experimental period for three successive days, so that when the experiment started on the fourth or fifth day, they were already stressed. And you know this is pre-stressed. And then when they did the uh, evaluation to see this RT pulsing, to see whether it stimulated uh, or induced ventricular fibrillation, stress certainly uh, enhance the possibility of uh, developing VFib, but the uh, administration of the beta blocker um, uh, reversed that. And he also had a very interesting anecdote to the patient who was very nervous right after her heart attack. And uh, you know, this is the, uh, uh, the number of ventricular premature beats. These are these extra beats that come from the ventricle which uh, can be a precursor to ventricular fibrillation. Uh, when they stay, stop lidocaine, which is a way to stop arrhythmias, 
the number of uh, ventricular uh, premature beats increased. But then when she meditated, the numbers of these uh, ventricular premature beats decreased. Um, and then lidocaine restored basically this, um, this, the normal heart so that you weren't at higher risk of developing these uh, fatal arrhythmias. So even in the 1970s, the importance of stress meditation was already uh, understood. And it's surprising to, to many of us, this hasn't really been emphasized in the 1980s or 90s. Um, and so they started to, they understood in the early, as early as the 1970s that the autonomic nervous system is an important component of developing ventricular fibrillation. So how do you evaluate autonomic nervous system? And I felt that this was an important to sort of take a little bit of a side um, note or explanation of how we normally evaluate autonomic nervous system and why heart rate variability has ultimately been the one that many have gone to. Um, and this is a, a good illustration of the autonomic nervous system. You have basically the two parasympathetic the two systems, the two branches of the autonomic nervous system uh, depicted here, the parasympathetic and the sympathetic on the bottom here, both have two sets of neur neurons in series, a preganglionic neuron, and then a unmyelinated postganglionic uh, neuron. And uh, you can see that the neurotransmitter that's uh, responsible for the parasympathetic nervous system is acetylcholine both at the ganglion at, and at the target tissue. Whereas for the sympathetic nervous system, it's acetylcholine at the ganglion, but largely it's norepinephrine at the target uh, tissue. The exception being the sweat gland. Um, and this is a, sort of an interesting difference about sweat glands um, that I don't know why it was evolutionarily developed that way, but we know in medicine, that uh, if you're exposed to uh, a dangerous fatal toxin such as sarin, which was something that was released by a terrorist group for this cult in the 1995, they released it in Tokyo subway. And you can see a lot of the, and the sarin is an acetylcholinesterase inhibitor. It basically prevents the breakdown of acetylcholine. And what we saw was a lot of the parasympathetic changes uh, attributed to this you know, significant rise of acetylcholine. You had um, uh, salivation, you had tearing, diarrhea, bronchoconstriction, constriction of the pupil, sweat, uh, and then all of that, which is attributed to the parasympathetic nervous system. But then you also saw sweating uh, because even though sweating is not part of the parasympathetic nervous system, you have the acetylcholine being um, being responsible for how the sympathetic nervous system operates at the sweat gland. So how do you evaluate the autonomic nervous system? The way I've divided it is into two parts. You can directly assess this, these parasympathetic, directly assess the autonomic nervous system, either by uh, measuring exactly the activity in these nerves or uh, measuring the neurotransmitters, or you could actually uh, visualize it or you have the indirect assessments, basically the end results of the sympathetic nervous system. And I could go into a little more detail about the direct nerve activities, the sort of direct assessments. First, you have direct nerve activity assessments, something called microneurography. For the sympathetic nervous system, you introduce a needle electrode into a nerve and then subsequently um, target a sympathetic nervous branch in that, um, or a, a nerve bundle within that, uh, that nerve. And it's oftentimes the, the nerve that's chosen is the peroneal nerve. I've had this done on myself. It's not comfortable. It's also very difficult to find um, the exact nerve. And also there are different branches within the nerve. So you have to target the muscle sympathetic nerve. Sometimes you target the, the skin sympathetic nervous system. But you can see here, uh, this is the heart or the EKG, this is blood pressure. And then you could see the sympathetic nervous activity and you could see some of the heart rhythms and you could also see a respiratory component in here as well. 
And then there's also direct assessment of the vagal nerve. They've only done this recently in the 2020s. And the only reason they've done this in humans recently is because it's a very hard uh, nerve to access. Basically, it's right next to the jugular vein and the carotid artery. And they really needed um, the ultrasound to, to visualize to make sure that the needle wasn't penetrating one of these you know, dangerous arteries or veins. And you could see the, the activity of the vagus nerve. And then when you do a root mean square, you could see the activity of the vagus nerve here. Then you could assess the neurotransmitters directly, either by uh, collecting true blood tests or urine tests and assess for the catecholamines that are in the system. They're often norepinephrine, dopamine, these other uh, compounds. And then you could do radial label neuroadrenaline spillover tests. I'm not going into too much detail that, but you administer a radial labeled noradrenaline. Some of it gets absorbed into the nerve and then some of it gets excreted. You could do a calculation to assess the activity of the sympathetic nervous system. Or you could do what's called an MIBG scan. You inject this radial nuclear or radial labor labeled compound uh, chemical called MIBG. It gets absorbed in the sympathetic nervous ner nerves. And this is an image of a person who is normal or healthy. And you can see that the MIBG accumulates in the heart. A lot of it accumulates in the liver. But a person with an autonomic nervous condition uh, has no absorption of this into the heart. So it indicates that basically there's uh, hardly any active uh, sympathetic nervous system in the heart for this individual. And then the last direct assessment is to actually do a skin biopsy. And why skin? It's because um, there are three areas where the sympathetic nervous system clearly has an influence. One is the erectopili muscle. Um, when you are nervous or uh, it's like getting goosebumps and uh, it causes the hair to rise. The other place is the blood vessels. The sympathetic nervous system innervates the blood vessel. And the last one is the sweat glands, as I had discussed before. So when you take a biopsy of the skin, you can actually take a look at the nerves, the sympathetic nerves, which is labeled here in green. And this is a comparison between a healthy person and on, on the left side compared to a person with diabetic neuropathy. And you can see that the sympathetic nerve is intact in the sweat glands for the healthy person, not so much in the diabetic neuropathic patient. Uh, same with the erectile pili, uh, and then uh, for the blood vessels, you could clearly see that difference. But these are clearly invasive approaches. Um, so you want to take a look at indirect assessments because that's more practical. And the way we do that is to take a look at these end organs, basically where the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system acts. And we see that the pupil has both parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system. The heart does as well. Sweat gland is uniquely at the sympathetic nervous system. But, um, and then I, uh, also the parasympathetic nervous system is important for the you know, gastrointestinal tract and the in the urinary system, but I didn't include it here. Um, now the question is, where's blood vessels for parasympathetic nervous system? Does the vagal nerve innervate or affect the blood vessels? And the answer is actually no. Uh, there is hardly enter any parasympathetic nerve innervation of the blood vessels, uh, particularly of the arteries. There are some exceptions. There are some innervation of the facial vessels, of the coronary arteries, and then also genitalial vessels. Um, so that you know, a lot of the erectile function is dependent on parasympathetic nervous system. Um, and this is important to know because this is um, why, how we could differentiate what's happening uh, in, in terms of the parasympathetic sympathetic nervous system because most of the vascular contra and contraction or dilation is mediated by the sympathetic nervous system. So what are the indirect assessments? You have in most hospitals an autonomic uh, lab or an autonomic testing lab. This is a picture that I was sort of put, took from YouTube. 
and it has a number of devices and you had something called a tilt table test. And what they do in these labs is you are connected to a lot of these measuring devices, but then you introduce a lot of these provo provocation uh, interventions. Valsalva, it's a type of maneuver, deep breathing, isometric hand grip, cold press and mental arithmetic, active standing, tilt table step, rare reflex sensitivity. I'm not gonna go into details about that, but what the, when they do that intervention, they are continuously assessing heart rate, blood pressure. In this case, um, they measure entitled CO2, which is carbon dioxide, and then cerebral blood flow. And this is the normal response when you do a tilt table. Basically a person's flat, and then as you are uh, measuring, these heart rates and blood pressure, you slowly elevate the person to an upright position. And you can see that the heart rate increases, the blood pressure name, uh, remains stable. However, in this person who has uh, neurogenic syncope or uh, loss of consciousness or fainting, what happens is that as you're slowly tilting up, you can see that the blood pressure drops down the heart rate tries to compensate, but at some point it fails and then the heart rate drops down and the person basically uh, loses consciousness. Um, so this is something that you could evaluate with these autonomic tests. And then you have indirect tests, again, of sweats. Uh, you have the thermal regulatory sweat tests where they apply a dye, um, which it's called quinazarin. Uh, it's a powder dye that you apply to the front of the, the ventral side or the front side of a person and you apply it all across the body. So it's, it's an inconvenient test because you have to strip down and then it changes color. Uh, it reacts to the sweat somehow and uh, it creates this purplish color. And so this is a normal uh, response. However, in a person with multiple system atrophy uh, with autonomic neuropathic problems, you can see that the lower parts of this person's body and some parts of the upper body were not functioning well. The sweats just simply weren't functioning. So it indicates this is a marker of autonomic nervous dysfunction. Another sweat test is electrodermal activity. Uh, this is something that you could use uh, using a watch. This is the Empatica E4 watch. Uh, which measures um, electrical skin conductivity with time. And you can measure it. And if there's any stressful event, it, you could see a quick rise in the conductivity. And uh, the final sweat evaluation test is something called QSART. Again, I'm not gonna go into too much details, but it's a complicated system that can only be done uh, in the laboratory in the hospital you introduce electricity, electrical um, stimulation to the skin, uh, into the system where it has acetylcholine. The acetylcholine stimulates the sweat duct here, but that there is a back or antidromic and then orthodromic response so that the adjacent sweat glands respond accordingly. And then uh, you will see that they will apply this to multiple parts, usually in the forearm, proximal leg, distal leg, and the foot. And you can see the response. And if you have problems in the lower leg, you will, for instance, not see this rise when you're introducing the acetylcholine. So these are the indirect sweat activity. The final one is the uh, pupillometry. And you could study the size of the pupil. A constricted pupil is, is mediated by a parasympathetic nervous system, a dilated pupil, is responsible for the sympathetic nervous system. And so you could take advantage of this. The problem is that the, the pupil, uh, pupils respond to several stimuli, one being light, the other one is near fixation. So if you're focusing on something nearby, it constricts. And then mental effort, which is sort of mediated by both of these autonomic nervous system. And so when you introduce light, either red or blue light, you could see that the pupil size really starts to decrease and then rises up after you stop shining the light onto the eye. When you're focusing, closing onto something, the, heart, uh, the pupil size decreases. And then for mental effort, on the other hand, it is only five, maybe 5% the amount of, in terms of magnitude of the response compared to light or near fixation. 
So when you're doing some kind of memory load, in this case, you're trying to remember the number of digits. And you can see for three to five, uh, you know, the response isn't that significant. But then when you're trying to remember seven uh, numbers, the pupils dilate a little bit. Uh, and what's interesting for me here is that, you know, it correlates a little bit with the number of uh, how hard the, math, the, the mentor effort is. So the more you have to remember, the, the, the greater the pupil size, although it's, it's really the, the magnitude is not that much. And this is actually an average of 25 trials. What's also interesting to me is there's an anticipatory factor here. So you're anticipating before you see the numbers and you are already responding. So if you are able to control a lot of these factors like light or near fixation, and you're able to do multiple trials with a significant memory load or mental effort, then maybe pupil size is something that you'd evaluate, but it's highly inconvenient and very difficult to do. And the final one, is heart rate variability. So to summarize, I think many have wondered, like, why are we focusing on heart rate variability? Why not some of these other options? And already by, you know, hearing some of the things that I've discussed to you, you can already tell that a lot of these are very impractical, only can be done. Many are invasive. Um, and the other thing that is worthy of note is, this is the summary of the direct and indirect assessments, is that many of them or most of them are focusing purely on the sympathetic nervous system. Um, and like for instance, the neurotransmitter based measurements, which measure catecholamine levels, we're not able to do this for the, the vagal system is because the vagal system relies on acetylcholine and there is a, a large amount of acetylcholinesterase in our bodies, which breaks down the acetylcholine. So you lose the ability to measure that into the blood system. Um, and then there's also very few parasympathetic nerves that you can see in the skin. Uh, and, uh, and sweat is largely mediated through the sympathetic nervous system. So um, this, you know, a lot of this is predominantly sympathetic nervous focused. And the ones that are vaguely mediated are, you know, this is microneurography, which is right by the neck, very difficult to do, again, highly risky. You can do the autonomic uh, testing that's done in the labs by introducing uh, various pr provocations, uh, but it's inconvenient because not only you need to uh, do a lot of these measurements, not only heart rate, but blood pressure is very important. If you can incorporate blood flow, uh, for instance, blood flow to the brain, that would also significantly help it out. Those are things that are very difficult to do at home. So the options that are available for researchers like us that don't have access to uh, many of these labs is basically two, electrodermal activity, um, where you could get the Empatica E4 or any other skin conductive devices. Unfortunately, they're very expensive. Or you could do heart rate variability. And heart rate variability is the only one that really uh, evaluates the parasympathetic part of the branch uh, well compared, I mean, electrodermal activity using these skin conductive uh, devices don't measure parasympathetics at all. So that's kind of like the summary. This emphasizes why heart rate variability has been the focus in much of autonomic nervous system research and will probably be the focus for wearable research as well in the near foreseeable future. So that's kind of the first part. I wanted to see if um, I could get some questions. Oh my God, it's too hard. Um, let's see, are there any questions? Yeah, feel free to write questions in the chat. Don't be shy. I'm not seeing any right now, but maybe we'll just give um, everyone a minute to think and digest all of this material and see if they have uh, a question that pops up. Now, this might be a little too technical, <laughs> but again, you have the opportunity to, uh, to review it um, on, in recordings. Okay. I would say, Dr. On, you can continue. And I invite everyone, again, as uh, William Dowie mentioned in the chat, feel free to submit your questions as they pop up as well. And then 
on the next break, Dr. On can, can address them. You're getting some praise here, Dr. Ah. On, well done. <laughs> Uh, fascinating oh. lecture. But yeah, there is a quick question here. Um, the question is, why not simpler? Um, what A quick question, simpler. What, why not one, simpler heart rate? Yeah, I think which one is yeah. heart rate versus heart rate variability? Yeah. Great question, Ashville. Um, and I'm going to, I think you've sort of, uh, yeah, you've you anticipated what I was going to talk about next. Mm -hmm. So I will talk about that. All right, stay tuned. <laughs> yes. Um, perfect. Cool. Thank you, Peter, for that. All right. Um, so now let's talk about um, go back to the clinical indications of heart uh, heart rate variability. So um, even then, uh, even as early as the 1970s, heart rate variability was recognized as a promising tool for assessing autonomic nervous system functioning. But is there any, was there any preliminary evidence to support the notion that heart rate variability can be translated to the clinical setting? And yes, there was. So the first evidence was in Wolf. It was done in Australia in the 1978. Uh, evaluated 230 patients admitted to the CCU for acute myocardial infarction. They took 60 second EKG on the day of the MET and calculated the RR interval variance, which is essentially the standard deviation of 30 consecutive beats uh, and assessed for hospital mortality. And um, they, he divided the group into two parts, those with sinus arrhythmia, and this is actually more specifically respiratory sinus arrhythmia. So it's, it's actually a good arrhythmia, not the, the deadly arrhythmias. And the ones with uh, sinus arrhythmias had lower mortality, about 4.1% versus 15.5%. And so you can see here, that those patients with no sinus arrhythmias are essentially low heart rate variability uh, compared to those with uh, sinus arrhythmias. Those in the, uh, with low variability had uh, a good number of deaths. Uh, and it, it was regardless of the heart rate. So this somehow, address, this somewhat addresses Eshkol's question um, is that yes, um, the heart rate didn't seem to necessarily differentiate those who would have been at risk of, at, uh, of dying of, uh, in the hospital, um, whereas the, those with <clears throat> heart rate variability, higher heart rate variability had lower rates of death. And this is the uh, sort of landmark study that was published by the Multicenter Post Infarction Research Group in 1987. And this is the first time to really indicate why heart rate variability got a lot of attention. This was a multi-center study. This was done, in fact, I think in multiple countries. 808 patients were recruited who survived acute myocardial infarction. They measured 24-hour continuous EKG 11 to three days after, plus or minus three days after the uh, myocardial infarction. They measured 24-hour standard deviation of uh, in an interval. This was their marker of heart rate variability. And they assessed all-cause uh, mortality. And you could see uh, the graph here. This is the Kathleen Meyer curve of survival with respect to time after myocardial infarction. And for those people with standard deviation SDNN above 100, in other words, high variability, had a greater chance of staying alive over the four years. Those with 50 to 100 have a lower chance of survival, and those below 50 clearly did poorly. So this received a lot of attention at that time. Uh, and to, to get to a little bit of the physiology, so what physiological process does SDNN most correlate with? So the question is, when you're looking at this, at least me as a clinician is, what is this indicating is happening here? And remember on my, this is the slide that I introduced in my first talk. It, the standard deviation really depends on the duration of the data. So if you're just measuring two minutes of heart rate, then the standard deviation relates to a high frequency domain uh, physiological process. That's respiratory sinus arrhythmia. When you're five minutes, largely it's the low frequency or bare reflex properties. But at 24 hours, you're talking about circadian or hormonal rhythms. And this prior study was a 24 hour standard deviation of uh, in an interval. So, um, you know, where it's it the circadian and hormonal factors are clearly playing a factor here uh, in um, in di distinguishing those people who survive and those who, who don't. 
And um, this same group basically did a follow-up study because they wanted to understand what accounted for this low variability, like what was sort of the differences, uh, what accounted for the differences in variability that they saw in these patients. And they took 10 patients with high heart rate variability and those with low heart rate variability. They matched them according to age, gender, risks, factors, et cetera. And then they compared their, their 24 hour continuous EKG two weeks after the myocardial infarction. And they found that the low heart rate variability generally had a faster heart rate, both day and at night. Um, there was less of a day and versus night heart rate, fair, heart rate difference, which again sort of gets to this notion that there's a circadian component here that is probably important. Um, but the other thing is that there was a lower proportion of success difference in N intervals, or this, the measure called PNN50, which again is a marker of the high frequency or the parasympathetic nervous activity in the body. And this is an example of uh, sort of the PNN50 over time uh, from midnight through the rest of the day. And you can see that the vagal nerve is highly active during that night and during the day it goes down and high in the high heart rate frequency. Uh, frequency uh, variability uh, group, but basically no change uh, in the low HRV group. Uh, so this was for time domain measurements because standard deviation PN and 50 are time domain measures. Like does frequency domain measures similarly have information about prognosis after an acute MI? And that was confirmed by this study done in 1992, again, by the same group. Uh, th they took 715 patients with acute MI, measured continuous EKG two weeks after the MI, and then they did the frequency domain analysis, and the outcome was all-cause mortality. And then they took a look at high frequency, low frequency, very low frequency, and ultra low frequency, and divided, of course, according to all-cause, and then divided, um, mortality in the cardiac or rhythmic. And you could see that the ones with a high Z factor, meaning it's more statistically significant, um, the ultra low frequency was the one that had the greatest prediction uh, for all cause mortality. The very low frequency had highest risk prediction for cardiac deaths. Whereas high frequency and low frequency, not so much. So uh, again, going back to the idea that a lot of these lower frequencies have some very important information. And you can see this visually. Uh, they've divided this into categories, the ultra low, very low, low frequency and high frequency. And you can see that there's a big difference between those who have high ultra low frequency and those with low ultra low frequencies, the ones uh, that high ultra tended to survive. Uh, and there's less of a difference uh, for high frequency range. And this is the summary of the data, um, it, uh, which was done by review and retno. And generally this positive response was replicated across all these studies, all through um, 1987 to 2002. You know, generally large trials with hundreds of patients. Uh, many of them were measured you know, a week to two weeks after the myocardial uh, infarction. And uh, they had measured uh, multiple, uh, and this was confirmed in various measures, including time domain, frequency domain. Um, and uh, and the, the key thing is that uh, this persisted, this, this positive result persisted despite being in the age of thrombolysis. You know, thrombolysis is administra administration of a drug which breaks down the clot that causes a heart attack. And so this positive effect obtains. This study, uh, which is the only negative study in this group, uh, was attributed to um, inappropriate breaking down of the groups. One group actually had more beta blockers, um, was generally healthier than the other group. So I think this was confounded by the results. Um, but what's important to know is that they also found that you didn't really need 24 hours, that even short uh, acquisition of heart rate variability, maybe, uh, two to 15 minutes or even five to 10 minutes was good enough to predict uh, for mortality. But then something changed. Now, this is the same table, but um, it's too big. But uh, these are the later studies that happened in 2005. 
And something happened after 2005. You started to develop these negative studies that didn't show a positive result in uh, when it comes to heart rate variability predicting mortality. And what happened around this time in 2005 was that you really had a massive uptick of angioplasty and stents, also incorporating beta blockers, which I had shown before significantly reduced ventricular fibrillation, uh, you know, chances of developing uh, ventricular fibrillation. And in this study alone, uh, you had uh, about 70% of the patients getting revascularized. 94% of them were already on beta blockers. So you started to see this difference. And um, I wanted to sort of quickly show you the, the dramatic rise of coronary revascularization that you saw um, in, during this time in the late 2000s. This is a graph that was obtained from the Netherlands from a single hospital. You could saw, see that the number of angioplasties has still increased, but importantly, the stents used to keep open the vessels, the coronary vessels that were blocked in a heart attack, had a dramatic rise. And more importantly also was that they started to involve, they started to do early reperfusion and they emphasized acting urgently when someone has a heart attack. Rather than waiting a day or two, they recognize that's really important. As soon as someone comes into the hospital, take them directly to the cath unit or to the, shirt, uh, to the operating room to reopen the vessels. And uh, the reason that happened is that, you know, they started to see evidence of quicker interventions, early reperfusion in enhancing uh, survivability after a heart attack. And this is a nice study that shows the hourly heart rate variability measurements after a PTCA intervention. This took about 123 patients uh, with the first MI. They took 24 hour Holter monitoring beginning at, at the hospital uh, admission. And then they followed these uh, markers, high frequency, low frequency, SD, SDNNI and RRI over time. And uh, you could see that right after getting the reperfusion or the intervention, you had a drop in the heart rate variability uh, and then uh, a steady rise in the heart rate, for, heart rate variability in all the measures here. Um, and this was done, you can see this for the early reperfusion individuals, those who got uh, revascularization 12 hours after symptom onset. However, those who got late reperfusion, if you wait 12 hours or more, you saw no change in this heart rate variability. So the heart rate variability, clearly uh, you, you can reverse it if you uh, reverse the reduction in the heart rate variability if you uh, do the revascularization early on. And this is an example of that study that was done in this era of immediate reperfusion. And again, I'm not gonna go into too much detail, but you, this was a 412 patients they had measured SDNN, uh, and they found out that standard deviation, this SDNN was no longer a significant risk factor for mortality. In fact, it had a p-value of 0.1, had a little bit of a trend, but really not statistically significant. So early reperfusion changed the heart rate variability equation in how we treat patients. It just no longer became useful in this era of imme immediate reperfusion. And what's uh, what it was interesting for me to find out was that in this specific study, only 7%, 19 out of 412 patients, had SDNN less than 50. This indicated that the interventions that were done was really effective in reversing the reduction of heart rate variability. And in comparison, the original 1987 MPEP study that I showed previously had about 15.5% of the patients with low SDNN. So the interventions that we're doing in cardiology was clearly making difference to recovering and improving heart rate variability. Um, and as a result of this, uh, in this era, we were starting to see that heart rate variability no longer had its specificity or positive predictive value. Um, in one year cardiac mortality or rhythmic events, heart rate variability alone, which is shown here, uh, based on the, you know, based on the sensitivity, it really had a very low positive predictive value. 
And the improvements that we saw in, in the delivery of cardiac care really showed up in the epidemiology of heart disease. We saw, for instance, the, the rates of heart disease death plummet significantly actually from 1970s onwards. In 1970, for instance, there was about 670,000 deaths per year. In 2010, about 412,000 deaths, the reduction of 39%, despite a rise in the overall United States population. And then the case fatality rates for those individuals who are hospitalized with acute MI, um, those who are less than 65 years of age, the rates of mortality in the hospitalization dropped from 16% to less than 2%. And those who are aged greater than 65 dropped from 38% to 7%. So heart disease is a success story for medicine. Um, and I did want to ignore the other um, condition for, for which heart rate variability has been uh, demonstrated to be useful, and that is autonomic neuropathy and diabetes. Uh, this was the sort of the landmark study done in 1990. There was 25 diabetic patients compared to 11 healthy controls. The diabetic patients had advanced cases, um, symptoms and signs suggestive of autonomic neuropathy, which included signs of impotence, bowel bladder disturbance, abnormal sweating. Uh, they tended to have diabetes for a long duration, peripheral neuropathy, and then they measured their autonomic function using the autonomic testing that I brief, briefly you know, described earlier. And then based on this testing, they were just able to distinguish those 25 patients into two groups, those with vagal neuropathy and those without uh, those with and without vagal neuropathy. And they evaluate the standard deviation of successive difference for um, the RR interval. And this is heart rate. You can see heart rate for the healthy individuals or, uh, with respect to time of day. And you can see that, uh, or basically the heart rate is uh, faster because the RR interval is shor shorter during the day. And then at nighttime, it's slower. Uh, for the healthy individuals. And then for the diabetic patients, either with, with or without vagal neuropathy, it has a lower RR interval. But the distinction is not that great. But when you use heart rate variability, you see the heart variability, the distinction between heart rate and heart rate variability is much greater. And uh, the heart rate variability really were able to detect those individuals uh, with autonomic symptoms, but not this label of vagal neuropathy according to this autonomic nervous system pretty well. So even for those people who were labeled as without vagal neuropathy had low heart rate, heart rate variability. So just to give a little bit of my interpretation of what of the heart rate variability clinical data, I would say that heart rate variability did really consistently well in predicting mortality before the age of coronary, early coronary revascularization and met optimization. And to me, it was surprising to see these consistent results, particularly given the market variability that you see in heart rate variability. And I'll talk about this later, but there's a lot of variability in heart rate variability between persons and also within individual, because the individual can see signs of change in heart rate variability through the course of the day. The greater heart rate variability seen in acute MI patients treated in modern era indicates that the treatments were effective but it also indicated that heart rate variability may still be useful because heart rate variability was showing actually that our interventions were really making a difference. And this is why we were seeing you know, dramatic reductions in heart disease deaths from acute MIs. And so heart, this is not to discount heart rate variability as measure. It just indicates that we were doing such a good job. The heart rate variability was, was increasing and it wasn't uh, good enough to distinguish those who were um, sort of um, going to be at risk later on of developing an, um, a death or mortality. There's something really important about very low frequency and ultra low frequency. I think this is an understudied area. And then the other understudied area is the temporal modulation of high frequency or RMSSD or low frequency uh, over the course of the days or weeks or even months. And this may be useful, but it's not, you know, it's understudied. Many of the high frequencies or low frequency data 
that was reported in these large randomized control trials were averages over the course of the day. And it really didn't respect the changes that you saw in high frequency, low frequency um, through the course of the day. Um, and the, the final thing is that even in the error of acute coronary revascularization, heart rate variability may still be utilizable for subacute late phases of post-MI. And the reason I say that is that the two studies that were positive in the angioplasty or the new revascularization era had obtained um, the heart rate variability much later in basically in the subacute phase of the post-MI um, time. And they measured 70 to six, you know, 70 days, even up to 120, you know, plus or minus 121 days. What this indicates is that there's a large tail. So probably a year, even a year after. Uh, and six weeks after, those are the ones that uh, heart rate variability turned out to actually show some promising uh, ability to predict uh, death. And then finally, heart rate variability may be exquisitely sensitive to the autonomic pathology as you know, documented by the diabetic autonomic neuropathy example. So that's kind of the, the second break. And then I promise I won't take too much longer on the third part. Um, any questions? Yeah, there's a few questions in the chat, Andrew, so I can read them out to you. Yeah. The first one is sort of a two-part question. Um, uh, Han Ping asks, I'm curious, are there any tricks about the indirect assessment of HRV? For example, how to obtain reliable HRV results? And except for HRV, which one of the indirect assessments is the most possible to be implemented in daily life? Yeah. Um, well, I think that there's certain tricks. And again, that's where uh, you smart <laughs> the smart audience has anticipated what I was going to talk about in the third part of this part two series. So I'll, I'll answer that, uh, Humping. Um, but to answer your question of which of the indirect assessments is the most possible to be implemented, I think those are the two that I'd mentioned, heart rate variability or the skin conduction uh, method, which is using the E4. Um, the heart rate variability does a better job with parasympathetic nervous system. It has some information about the sympathetic system, but it's, you know, it's mixed in with the parasympathetic. Uh, but uh, when you're talking about focusing on the sympathetic nervous system, you really want something like the, the measurement of skin conductance. And you could, you know, the skin conductance can change with time. So that's why these devices can be very sensitive um, to, to figure out what what effects are causing change in sympathetics. Like if you're stressed, you'll see a rise in that. The, the challenge with the conductance things is that it really depends on humidity. Uh, and also if you're active, you're sweating, you're, you can you know, really dramatically increase the skin conductivity and then you're not able to distinguish uh, events like stressful events or any type of stimuli of sympathetic nervous system uh, after that happens. So that's one of the disadvantages of that. Great, thank you, Andrew. Um, another question is um, by Francis, are there influences of SNS, PNS to different organs um, at the same time? Are they happening at the same time or are the influences in different pathways? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, yeah, I, I, you know, I don't know the true answer to that, but I could tell you that um, the sympathetic nervous system, for instance, has specific activities that differ depending on which organ you're talking about. For it's the kidney, uh, if you measure the sympathetic nervous system in the kidneys, they have its own, they have their own localized sympathetic nervous system that may be different than the muscular sympathetic nervous system. So when we're talking a lot about these measures such as the muscular, like the MSNA, which is the muscular sympathetic nervous activity, um, it is much more of an overall sympathetic nervous system that is uh, mediated or coordinated by the central nervous system, like your brain. But then there are also local effects that could change or modify that central uh, activity. So that's a great question. And um, yeah, I, in the parasympathetic also, I think that also could be true 
uh, specific, specifically, for instance, the gastrointestinal tract uh, could be active, whereas you know the rest of the body may not have the same response. Um, so it you do have some localized differences for sure. Great. Next question is: um, Is there a standard pattern of HRV which can be used to predict MI or sudden cardiac arrest? What is the appropriate duration of HRV measurement for that purpose? Standard or pattern of heart rate which you can use? Um, I am not sure uh, how to answer. I mean, all I can say is that heart rate variability is rather nonspecific. It just shows that if you are in a in a dire condition where you have an MI or even you're under a lot of stress, your heart rate variability goes down. And this could be uh, particularly in the high frequency and low frequency range that you can see that. Um, and then this could persist depending on how long your condition can last for. So if you're stressed for a short period of time, your heart rate variability can sort of recover. However, if you have, for example, an example I provided was the uh, reperfusion example of someone who gets the catheterization more than 12 hours after the symptom onset, you saw that the heart rate variability actually did budge because their condition got to the point where it got irreversible. There was scarring into the heart and then you know, the body is, is still at the sympathetic drive. And so you could see the persistence of heart rate variability, the low heart rate variability um, persist in that situation. So I would say that there really isn't any standard pattern. It's highly sensitive and it's highly dynamic temporally. So it really will change according to a number of factors, but really depends on what condition we're talking about. Sorry, that's a long answer. That's okay. Thank you so much for, for sharing that answer. The next question is, would you be able to share a reference list used to create the past two presentations for people to review the paper details discussed in more detail? Thank you. Yeah, I, I could do that. I mean, I, I also made sure that the, the sites, the, the citations were in the slides themselves. So if you can, you could see the exact citations so you could take a look. Uh, it's maybe too small, but maybe on YouTube, you could take a look uh, at the, the citations. If that doesn't work, Joe, just let me know and um, we, could, we could provide you uh, a list. It's just that I haven't compiled that and that takes a little bit of time. So I'm a little more dis disorganized. <laughs> no problem. All right, thanks, uh, Andrew. The next one is given your comments on dianeural um, diurnal, sorry, and day-to-day -day variations in HRV, and now data on long-term HRV from wearable ambulatory data. Are there any attempts to use machine learning to explore new measures or analytic approaches to HRV? Yeah, that's a great question. I actually don't know. Um, I, I think heart rate variability has, um, is an era of a lot of, I mean, it's going through a lot of dynamic changes. And since there's a lot of machine learning and a lot of excitement, particularly in the wearable world, there is um, there is certainly going to be emphasis on applying machine learning. But what I've seen largely is that a lot of the focus has been in high frequency uh, heart rate variability, like seeing RMSSD or, or high frequency over the, the span of the day. And so they're focusing a lot on that, like uh, Whoop and uh, I think Aura, all those things, they tend to focus a lot on the high frequency range. Um, so they are possibly evaluating uh, machine learning for that specific method. However, when it's talking about long-term heart rate variability, I would say that that still is a major under-recognized, under-appreciated part of heart rate variability that I would presume that not many people are actually taking a look at that and you know, using machine learning for that. Great, um, Alan Heldman asks for SCD, do you think low HRV is a specific causative risk factor or is it just a marker of a neuroendocrine high risk state? In other words, heart failure. Yeah, uh, I think it's much more of a marker. That's a great question, Alan. Um, I think it's a much more of a marker of that than uh, a, a direct cause. Um, but in part five of this series, I will talk about how heart rate, this is why I titled heart rate variability itself as a desirable target. 
there's some data to suggest that heart rate variability itself can be healthy, like a high heart rate variability. And it's not just a reflection of what's happening in the body. In the case of the sudden cardiac death, the low heart rate variability is due to the high sympathetic tone that you have in acute MI situation. The high sympathetic tone causes changes in the heart, the myocardium that in, enables sort of sudden cardiac, you, you get re-entry mechanisms that causes these abnormal arrhythmias. You also increase the chance of ectopic beats. So certain parts that are scars that gets all of a sudden sort of create ectopic beats. So it's just that the heart rate variability are able to um, reveal a high sympathetic tone that causes these arrhythmias to develop. So hopefully that answered your question. Great, thank you so much. The next one, there's two more, I believe. Okay. So the Eshkel asks, does Im impedance cardiography bias anything beyond standard ECG? Yeah, I, I love this question. Um, it's one of those things that I'm very interested in. I think impedance cardiography is particularly useful in assessing cardiac output um, because you know it's a matter of uh, well, cardiac output, as well as it, it does have some reflection to respiration, because when you breathe in, you have more blood that sort of floods into the lungs. Um, and so it does provide cardiac output, maybe respirations that EKG doesn't you know, always do greatly. Uh, in fact, EKG just doesn't assess for cardiac output. So that would be, I think, it, it shows some promise. Um, yeah, and if there's some affordable devices out there, certainly I think that we should explore that. Great, the next question, a uh, bit of context. Um, Alan says, the same question will come to the use of HRV in fitness, as you already showed on an earlier slide. Uh, yep. Is HRV a marker or is it something one wants to directly address or optimize? Yeah, yeah. Alan, I think you also anticipated, but my... <laughs> The talk that I was going to talk about in part five. So unfortunately, that's going to have to be for a few months because I'm doing this like every month. Uh, but yeah, uh, and this is part two. Maybe okay. we should move, maybe we should move on, and I could I could ask answer the other questions. Is that is that okay? Just because of yeah, time. absolutely, absolutely. We can always um, save the for uh, questions that are still coming for the end. So no problem. Okay. Again, again, uh, for those people who have to leave, feel free to. We're going to um, post this up on YouTube. Um, and I'll get to the last section, hopefully, um, in good time. So um, why is, then the question is, why is heart rate variability not utilized in clinical medicine? Well, it's just seemingly irrelevant in an era of coronary revascularization and medical optimization. I had mentioned before that heart rate variability was no longer specific, had a low positive predictive value. Uh, it, you know, we just did too good a job when it, we were addressing acute MI. And even if we had low heart rate variability, it really doesn't change what we do in the hospital. So that's the thing. I mean, it doesn't really change wh wh whether we would try to revascularize, whether we would, you know, administer beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, aspirin, the whole bit. So, you know, it, even if it's low, it doesn't change management. And so that's why heart rate variability is just not um, utilized particularly in the hospital setting. Um, and this gets to the, the, the slide that I showed on the first talk and why heart rate variability is considered antiquated from the conventional medical community. It's, you know, it just, it just seemed like it was pertinent into the 1980s and 1990s when, uh, you know, cardiac care wasn't that optimal. Um, and, but you have a different perspective than those people who are studying this at home. The other reason why heart rate variability is not utilized in clinical medicine is that it's just cumbersome for data collection, storage, and analysis. This is something that we'd like to address in uh, PhysioQ, uh, and so hopefully that's not going to be an issue in the, in the future. But remember that EKGs, uh, you know, in particularly 24 EKGs or Holter monitoring, this is Holter when he first discovered it, was really cumbersome and difficult. Uh, and the first one, uh, I think it was in the 1960s, it weighed about 80 pounds. This is how it looked like. And then in the 1980s and 90s, you still had to use these reel-to-reel -reel devices and also cassette recorders. I mean, you're carrying uh, this around. And in order to analyze this data, this was all analog data. This was not digital. So it's something that you had to, you know, uh, 
take a look, visualize. They have to have special programs to figure out when was the beat to beat interval. Very hard to do. And that's why not too many people in the 1980s and 90s were capable of doing this. They didn't have the tools. They didn't have the analytical system to make it happen. Uh, and during a time when I was training uh, and then in the late 1990s and then the 2000s, this is what we used. Um, this was something that you put around the neck. It was cumbersome. You, you couldn't sort of wear it around. It was hard to take a shower with it. And now um, things have changed. So you could have these wearables. You have the watches. This is a Zyle patch you could put on. This can last on for 14 days. You know, the Polar you can place on there for a day if you wanted to. There, I guess it depends on the battery life and whether your comfort level. But even with these devices, it's really difficult to incorporate EKG data because we're in the era now of electronic medical records. And electronic medical records is a satellite system. Each hospital has their own system. A lot of them have Epic, Meditech, uh, Cerner, et cetera. It's very hard to acquire or integrate some of this data that you get at home and incorporate it in the electric electronic medical record. So there is a, you know, a difficulty in incorporating this and putting it into practice. The other thing is it's difficult to integrate heart rate variability into um, a disease-centric hospital-based system. Heart rate variability, in some may say, is much more of a health, positive health marker. And so we're not really designed in medicine to address a positive marker. We're very much focused on diseases. Um, the other thing is that it's hard to, as I mentioned, um, acquire this in an outpatient setting. It's not reimbursed. So if we measure heart rate variability, we don't get reimbursed by insurance companies. And the other thing is primary care doctors, clinicians are overwhelmed. Um, they just don't want to deal with this extra data that comes into them. And, you know, it can be complex data set. And one primary care doctor, it, it, you know, it said that they didn't want to get this data because they don't want to be liable for it. If something was shown on heart rate variability and it showed that something was wrong, they don't want to miss it. So, you know, it's a stressed, very busy, disease-centric, hospital-based system. And so something like heart rate variability is probably not going to be incorporated for a while for that reason. And the final thing is heart rate variability tends to be very messy because there are numerous confounding factors. This doesn't discount it. It's just that it is highly sensitive. So there are many things that could affect it. And this is where I'm gonna sort of spend the last part of this series to this part two, to talk about what factors influence heart rate variability. The first one that's really important to recognize is that there is a significant correlation with heart rate. Um, and you can see this, this graph where our interval, which is a inverse of heart rate, and you can see high frequency and you can see that the higher the uh, higher the heart rate or lower the R interval, the lower the high frequency that you see here. Um, and this sort of goes a little bit to what Eshkal was asking about, like, well, doesn't this mean that heart rate then is essentially equivalent to high frequency? That a low heart rate is suggests high heart frequency, high frequency, etc. I think, yes, that does show some things, but as you see here, that there is much more variability on the, on the vertical graph here, that you'll see a lot more of a range in the high frequency. So high frequency tends to be much more sensitive and it has much more of a specific uh, focus on parasympathetics, whereas heart rate itself is a balance between parasympathetic and sympathetic. Um, and this just goes to show you the faster the heart rate, lower the heart rate variability. The other reason that, the other thing that I wanted to say was heart rate variability sometimes actually has different information than heart rate alone. Uh, and heart rate is much more a component of tonic control. It's sort of the mean vagal versus sympathetic tone. Whereas uh, heart rate variability, particularly high frequency, which is the respiratory sinus rhythmias, is a modulation, a respiratory modulation of the heart rate. And when you have things that you, you know, when you're at rest, you're relaxing, you're asleep, that causes both your RSA, so your high frequency to go up, your heart rate to go down. And then conversely, when you're under stress, when you are exercising, you're, you're tense or you have heart failure, you're, you're basically your heart high frequency uh, variability goes down 
and your heart rate goes up. So in both these situations, you have sort of similar effects. However, um, when you have increased blood pressure, as an example, um, there is some evidence to suggest that it has the reverse effect. So high blood pressure will cause uh, your blood pressure to go down. So it causes more bradycardia, but at the same time, it reduces your high frequency uh, component of frequency, uh, uh, the heart rate variability. So it's a little different. So your heart rate and heart rate variability responds differently to blood pressure increase. And the other thing is that the heart rate variability uh, responds to um, your CO2 levels, whereas heart rate, not so much. So this is how heart rate variability and heart rate are different. So my, from my perspective, I think you should get both heart rate and heart rate variability because they um, both sort of incorporate different information. But there are some, um, some coherence, there's some uh, links to both of them. The other factor is posture. Uh, this is an example of someone who's laying down at rest. And then when you tilt them up, you can see the changes in the R interval. So when they're laying down, the R interval is elevated. In other words, the heart rate is lower. And then when you're sitting up, the blood pools down to your legs and then your heart rate goes up. So this is about 106. And when you do the high frequency, when you do the frequency analysis of this, you can see that actually um, the high frequency components are going down. The low frequency theoretically should go up. Uh, because if, if you recall, the low frequency is a, a pseudo marker of the sympathetic nervous system. And when you're sitting up, your blood vessels need to contract. In order for that to happen, the sympathetic nervous system needs to kick in. So naturally, the low frequency needs to be high when the sympathetic nervous system is in there. But in, when you calculate the actual area under the curve, you will see that there isn't much of a difference uh, because the low frequency is actually lower. Um, at 413 uh, compared to here. Um, even though it looks uh, larger, the overall area is actually smaller than this region. And the reason is when you're sitting up, your heart rate goes up, your heart rate variability goes down. And so proportionally, the large light, low frequency plays a larger role, but overall the total power decreases. So this is why posture is an important thing to consider when you are um, doing heart, heart rate variability. Uh, and this is why when you're doing frequency dom domain analysis, you will normalize the data. You, you, know, you can see, for instance, at rest when you're laying down, the total power of the, the frequency is elevated, but when you're sitting up, the total power is decreased. But you can see that the overall contribution, the low frequency is larger when you're in an upright position. So this is the, the focus on this sympathobagel balance, this low frequency versus high frequency ratio. And this is why this is being used because it is supposed to account for the changes in the total power that you get with posture change. Um, so this is what you can use. The other factor that comes into play was respiratory rate. This is, some, this is uh, fast breathing going to slower breathing. And you can see that the changes with RR interval, when you take a breathe in, your R interval goes down or your heart rate goes up. And if you breathe out, your heart rate goes down. And uh, you can see that the magnitude, the amplitude is much greater when you breathe, take slower breaths. So this is another thing to consider. When you're taking slower breaths, your heart rate variability is gonna increase, particularly I'm just focusing on the respiratory sinus rhythm here. Stress is the other thing. At rest, you can see that the heart rate variability has a nice fluctuations. When you're doing mental rhythmic stress, it, you, know, you have a heart rate increase, but significant you know, reduction in the fluctuations. And then same for exercise. And then for those people with severe CHF or congestive heart failure, you basically have no variability in this example here. Uh, and then the next few slides, we'll talk about actually this great study that was just published in Lancet Digital Health in 2020. It was published by Fitbit Research Group. Um, and this is what happens when you have access to millions of people who have data. I'm not sure if all of them agreed to have this data analyzed, but um, basically uh, uh, 8.2 million Fitbit users uh, 
had their data analyzed on September 1st, 2018. The data was collected for 74 countries. United States was well represented in this data set. And they were able to sort of assess the uh, effects of heart rate variability, certain influences, certain factors of uh, that influence heart, heart rate variability. In this case, this was age. You can see from age 20 to 60, and you can see the different measures that they used here. RMSSD and high frequency, they kind of shared similar results because again, this is high frequency results. This is low frequency SDRR. SDRR in this situation, they took five minutes portions and five minutes, again, if I, you can see my prior slides it deals with low frequency. So you are seeing the low frequency range here. And so what do I get from this results? You can see that with age, your heart rate variability unfortunately goes down uh, and that the heart rate variability tends to go down faster with the high frequency compared to the low frequency. I mean, it doesn't seem like it here, but you'll have to take a look at the, the scales here. And it, this sort of magnifies the, the changes, but basically when you do the calculations, your high frequency decreases dramatically with age. And the authors had suggested, what this tells you is that your parasympathetic declines more rapidly as you age compared to the sympathetic nervous system. The other difference that's noted here is that the men, this is men in blue, uh, female in red, and then the solid lines are 6 a.m., dotted dashed lines are at 6 p.m. And you can see that men tend to have larger, large, uh, low frequency, uh, power both during the day, morning and evening, uh, whereas not much of a difference in the high frequency. So you see the effects of age and you see the effects of gender. Um, and the other final thing that I just wanted to point out that there's huge inter-individual variability. You could be what's considered normal in the 20 years of age within this like standard one standard deviation you could be here and you could still be considered normal um, you know, at the with the same value at the age of 60. So there's a lot of individual inter individual variability here. There's a circadian rhythm here as well. Um, these are for high frequencies and low frequencies. And you can see that there's a peak at 5 to 8 a.m. and nadir around 7 to 8 p.m. for all the high frequency, uh, all the frequency measures that you had here. Um, interesting, the low frequency, for whatever reason, you see an earlier phase shift. Uh, to the left for the elder, older people. I don't know why that is, but clearly there is a circadian shift here. And then physical activity also plays a significant role in affecting your heart rate variability. Uh, they took, this study took uh, basically the average number of steps that you take per day over the past 90 days. And then they, uh, you know, evaluate the effect of that on your heart rate variability. And you can see for all the measures that they obtained here, that the more steps you took, the greater your heart rate variability goes. So it's good to exercise if you're focusing on increasing heart rate variability. And um, you can see, um, so they've, this is a comparison between the younger folks versus the older folks. And the, the numbers that I want you to focus on are here on the right-hand side, which is shown by Sigma. This tells you the number of steps you need to take in order to increase one millisecond squared on average of your heart rate variability. So if you're young, it will take, you know, only 30 steps maybe in order for you to increase your heart rate variability one milliseconds. However, if you're older, it requires 50 up to 300 steps for us to um, really increase your heart rate variability. And there is a difference also for us older folks is that it's much harder to increase your high frequency power. So uh, it's harder for us to increase our parasympathetics. Uh, you would need to do up to 300 steps, particularly men versus women, uh, in order to increase our high frequency. So, um, you know, high frequency is sort of a sad story for many of us elderly men is that you know, it, it, heart rate variability decreases uh, fast, uh, particularly the high frequency range in the parasympathetics as you age. And it takes much more work for us to regain that high, heart, high frequency variability. 
And this is a nice uh, review that was done by Fattison in 2016 that shows all the factors that come into play. We talked some of it about age, gender, ethnicity is one thing that there's some consideration for. Lifestyle factors, activity, exercise, we talked about that. Physiological causes, you know, heart disease, diabetes, asthma, et cetera. And then mood, like stress is another thing. And then some environmental factors, like, you know, whether you're exposed to pollution, et cetera. So this is a nice review, um, but it tells you the heart rate variability is a holistic marker that sort of assesses all these things. And you have to take these into consideration if you really want to incorporate research. And in order to do that, you really have to control for potential confounders. There are a lot of things that influence uh, heart rate variability. Dan Quintana, who's an expert in heart rate variability, sort of gives this nice graph. You have to consider caffeine intake, some of your medications, such as beta blockers or you know, alpha blockers, for instance. Uh, depress antidepressants, TCAs can also affect it. Alcohol consumption, time of day, exercise, food intake, water intake, and also bladder filling can also play a, a role. And, uh, you know, this is why when you're doing autonomic nervous system testing at the hospital, you have a very detailed procedure in order to prepare for the autonomic nervous system. You know, you, you have to, you know, stop a lot of these medications 48 hours before, some of it 24 hours beforehand, no alcohol and a G6 12 hours before. In the morning out, no support stockies, no corsets, no confined clothing and then three hours before, no nicotine, caffeine, and food. So you have to take these into consideration when you're doing research, uh, when you're incorporating heart rate variability. So my recommendations for heart rate variability, you really want to um, obtain heart rate variability measures in identical settings. This means same time, same posture, environment, activity, et cetera, to avoid potential confounders. If you're not able to account for this or control it, then at least record them. Uh, you know, and then account for other potential factors like whether you're stressed, time of meals, sleep times and quality, et cetera. Accounting for these things will really make the heart rate variability of data that you collect useful. The other thing I mentioned is incorporate heart rate along with heart rate variability because sometimes they have different information. And the final thing is you, or the next to last thing is it's better to choose within person versus between person analysis because there's a lot of variability that happens between individuals. So you wanna follow variability over time. And then you wanna consider including electrodermal measurements as to, this is the answer to Han Ping's question. Uh, you could use the uh, skin conductance measures as another way to assess sympathetic nervous system. So the final summary, thank you for your patience. I know this went way over long overboard, but. 1980s and 2000s saw major advances in cardiovascular care. Heart rate variability was and remains the most practical means to assess uh, autonomic nervous system. Heart rate variability lost its prognostic usefulness for post-MI mortality with the advent of modern cardiovascular care. But however, it still may be useful for diagnostic, uh, diagnosis of diabetic autonomic neuropathy and overall autonomic function. And many factors influence heart rate variability. Accounting for these factors will influence or, or improve your heart rate variability usefulness in your research. And then that's it. So thanks for that. And I think that's time for questions. Great. So we will yeah, jump right into the final Q&A session. Um, I'm going to read the question that wasn't able to be answered uh, from the previous session. As you mentioned, HRV is useful for DM and post-MI monitoring. Do you think HRV can be a clinical parameter for post-treatment cardi cardiac catheterization? Is HRV superior to conventional echocardiography in terms of following up? Yeah, that's a great question, Sasha Cool. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think it can be. Um, like it could be a way to assess whether cardiac catheterization really made a difference or not. Um, but again, what makes it a little complicated is that oftentimes when people come in, particularly if their blood pressure is high or something like that, we automatically start beta blockers. Um, and so that confounds the results a little bit. Um, so even if we get the heart rate variability right after catheterizations, I don't know how much it will be helpful, how helpful it will be. 
Um, and so that makes it a little bit of uh, a challenge. There's a lot of confounding factors. Um, but as I had suggested on the other data, that there may be some use of obtaining heart rate variability after you have that acute phase of, of post-MI phase over. Um, so you could use that. Echocardiograph, uh, like we always obtain echocardiograms after an MI uh, just to see the extent of the damage that you get. It's always good to get a baseline after someone has a heart attack. You want to see what territories were involved in. And you could see also like after the catheterization, after your discharge, you can see which parts have recovered or not. So echocardiograph gives a lot of information that heart rate variability does not. And um, I think that's why we obtain it. And actually, I think it does provide a lot of good prognostic information that heart rate variability doesn't in the era of rapid uh, reperfusion. So that's that's hopefully answers your question. Great. Are there okay. any other questions? Oh, I see another one popping up. All right. What role can HRV play in managing chronic conditions and especially chronic stress? I think it can play a significant role uh, because chronic conditions, um, you know, it's, it's a sustained, you know, some say it's like a sustained level of sympathetic nervous system activity. And, um, and then, you know, some talk about sort of adrenal fatigue uh, and the question is, you know, can heart rate variability sort of detect that? I mean, certainly can detect some of the sympathetic hypersensitive, like act, hyperactivity. Um, I don't know whether it can detect adrenal fatigue or, uh, but, you know, that's something that I will review and potentially talk about in future talks. Great. Thank you so much. Andrew, are there any more questions for Dr. Ahn? today. I'm so sorry this went way overboard. <laughs> it's okay. It's fascinating. I don't think people are going to be complaining about that. There you go. See, everyone is, is so thankful. So we really, really appreciate it, Dr. On. Thank you so much. If there are any um, further questions, feel free to reach out to us. You can reach us at hello at physioq.org and we can share those questions with Dr. On. Um, just to wrap up here today, Thank you so much again, Dr. An, for being with us, for sharing your breadth of knowledge on such a fascinating topic. And we're really looking forward to the next session. Uh, we don't have an exact date yet, so please don't forget to follow us on Twitter. Um, if you registered for this event, we will also, I'll send you a message in the coming weeks to let you know the exact date. So you can register for that. Um, we wanna thank you all participants for joining us live. We really appreciate you being here today. And we also wanna add that we know there's a lot of collective knowledge on these calls and sessions. So um, if anyone would like to collaborate with us in the future on a, a workshop topic of their choice, feel free to reach out to us at, again at hello at physioq.org. And um, we'd love to collaborate. If you or you know anyone that would be interested, let us know. Great, so that's it for today, folks. Thank you so much and uh, enjoy the rest of your Monday. Have a great week. Goodbye, everyone. Hi, thank you.